All right. Welcome, everyone, to our second evening lecture of the semester. I'm really thrilled to introduce tonight Meng Yan and his Shenzhen-based practice, Urbanus, which he co-founded with his partner, Chao Du Lu. If this semester's lectures are an attempt to trace how architectural and urban practices are today constructed, Urbanus has no doubt emerged as one of the most interesting and influential model of its kind since its founding in 1999. Around that time, forays into China's opening up and the accompanying rapid urbanization that resulted were proliferating in the West, from Kulhas's research on the Pearl River Delta to Hull's pamphlet architecture series and to the start of significant international competitions and commissions, Hull's linked hybrid, the CCTV international competition, the bird's nest, which brought together Herzog and Nimeron and the artist and activist Ai Weiwei, or Zaha Hadid's Guangzhou Opera House, to name but a few of the most significant icons of the beginning of the 21st century. Amidst this breathtakingly fast building boom, Urbanus, as the pra practice's name suggests, develops an architecture that is deeply embedded within the new Chinese urban condition registering its speed and embracing its scale, but also recognizing its infrastructural and connective gaps and actively engaging its historical fabric. While the previous generation of architects chose to advance architecture either only in relation to itself or only in relation to generic conditions, such as the question of globalization, for example, and with both positions leading to a certain disinvestment from the question of context, leading to Kulhas's famous fuck context, which he declares in his essay, Bigness, Urbanus emerges instead as leading a new generation of architects that is both entirely global in its thinking and ambition, as well as through its conversations among colleagues and collaborators from around the world, but is also entirely embedded in a localized practice able to channel its deep knowledge of the context it is operating in toward affecting real change. Whether they are breathing new life into existing buildings and neighborhoods, as with their thoughtful Shomyip urban village project, their beautiful rehabilita rehabilitation of the old housing typology of the Tulu housing project, which was exhibited at the Cooper Hewitt a few years ago with rave reviews, or their transformation of an old industrial neighborhood into the Loft cultural complex, or whether they are intervening with a combination of boldness and restraint, as with their buildings for the Science and Technology Library University of Shenzhen, or the Dauphin Art Museum, Urbanist is single-handedly advancing architecture as practice and as discourse within the completely uncharted territory that is Ch Chinese urbanization. In fact, their practice and engagement in shaping the architectural landscape and urban thinking for the country goes beyond building. Realizing both the need and potential for architects to bring their skills as synthesizers, coordinators, and collaborators, they have embraced a sense of responsibility in facilitating discussions across a spectrum of actors that range from government planners to developers, residents of urban villages, as well as other colleagues, architects engaged with urban redevelopment, to share ideas and concerns through their gallery E6, formed as a strong and unique platform for collaboration and exchange. Extending this role as leaders shaping the field, this year the two partners are co-creating the Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale of Urbanism and Architecture, one of the most energized Biennale that has emerged in recent years with a very strong kind of streak uh, of a kind of urban thinking. They have won numerous awards, too many to name here today, but everything from architectural record awards to plan awards to the WA Chinese Architecture Achievement Award in 2016. And if you are interested, they are hosting a Chinese language discussion at GSAP on October 14th about the event um, uh, with GSAP alumnus Zhong uh, Shan Huang. Did I say it correctly? No. Terrible. It's okay. It's okay. Tonight, <laughs> we are really thrilled uh, to welcome uh, Meng Yan. Please, welcome. Thank you for your great remarks. Um, um, 
thanks and GSAPP to uh, bring us back to New York. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, we live and work and survive in New York, um, just as you guys do. And uh, 2001, uh, we come back. We, we went back to China and to practice uh, mainly in Shenzhen and Beijing. Um, so I, but for some reason, um, we always felt that we are not, uh, we never really left New York. I think the city uh, has inspired us uh, for many years, especially at the for kind of formative uh, time of our practice. New York is such a unique uh, experience for us, not only because of its high density, uh, the kind of vibrancy of his, uh, of his city. Um, it has been kind of a model city, an ultimate city of all cities for many to uh, research, to reference, even uh, to target for. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, Architecture uh, for the city, the subtitle is uh, City Above the City and City Inside the City. It's a, you will see a lot of these are uh, inspired from our earlier New York experience. For architecture lecture, I think one of the fundamental dilemma is to talk about architecture in a very isolated and abstract way, uh, project by project. So I would like to today to reformat my lecture uh, to give a much more contextual background and understanding and help people uh, to understand why and how um, we do this and that. So I will start from uh, this topic. Um, back in the, the 80s, this is when the late 80s, this is when we were uh, studying in Tsinghua in Beijing. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a background. Before Urbanus was formed, um, there was a radical uh, art movement in 1980s. It was at the time of uh, very strong economic reform, political considerations, and uh, hope and no hope. Uh, a, a very kind of contradictory uh, period of time. But everybody knows that after 1989, uh, the system, uh, the, the kind of situation changes. So we basically, uh, as a student, what I did is to kind of retreat from the reality and, and study and the kind of traditional Chinese culture and Chinese Garden of the Literati is totally detached from the reality, what is happening around us. So this is a kind of situation uh, after, so I was doing all these little paintings and, 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 and studies. At the time, uh, the city I live, uh, Beijing, was a pretty much a horizontal city, a two-dimensional city. It contains cities within cities. So you, it's kind of like a big maze that you really not have a chance to see the city as a whole because you are only part of this experience of intertwined hutongs and courtyard houses uh, with a mixture of the Soviet style uh, downway and, and big uh, super block and with fragments of uh, modern uh, architecture. It's kind of a mix of this horizontal kind of experience. But after, uh, when I came to New York, I see the completely different uh, type of city. Not only just the vertical uh, uh, skyscrapers, but the kind of intensity of how the city presents itself. In, in, in the Chinese eyes, beyond just the, the, the kind of intensity of the skyscrapers, I also see uh, the kind of poetic atmosphere um, behind this type of uh, scene. In my eyes at the time, the city really transforms itself into kind of a traditional Chinese uh, vertical uh, hand scroll. It's, it's, it has the mountains and seas and, and, and valleys. 
And even the water towers on the top of the buildings, uh, in my eyes, becomes little pavilions and tea houses. It, it stirred up a lot of imagination, even the noise, the, the ambulance, the, the fire trucks on the streets. And to me, it's very strangely uh, transformed itself into uh, something quite different. So I always see the city uh, exist um, in two different ways. One is the city that we experience uh, in the public uh, domain in, on the streets is a vibrant city. But once you get on the uh, elevator and go up through the dark tunnel and all of a sudden you reach the top, you see a completely different kind of city. So it's a city above the city. It, it, it gives you a completely uh, different experience. So at the time, uh, we, when we were in New York, uh, we walk around the city and, and, and read books. Of course, you know, this type of experience uh, stimulates a lot of uh, research. And uh, so I did a series of sketch-ups little uh, drawings, trying to catch up the kind of myths exist here and there uh, in the, the city. I always see there is something hidden uh, at the point somewhere uh, in this kind of vertical three-dimensional city, alive, above. So later on, um, we went to Shenzhen. Shenzhen was a model city and still is. Uh, for China's economic reform. At 1979, uh, Deng Xiaoping set up this kind of experimental field in the southernmost border of China. It was quite a clever uh, move. So after that, uh, for 20 years, uh, the city has grown from uh, 30,000 uh, population to uh, 13 million. And then, in 79, it looked like this. And all of a sudden, now it has a population more than 20 million. So it was a, a very dramatic uh, change during the past 20, 30 years. I was there, witness. In 1988, I was at the shore uh, of Shuko, which actually the starting point of the economic reform. Now, even the ship once Deng Xiaoping was at is sitting in the swimming pool because the city expanded so dramatically. So, and the Chinese photographer captured uh, the kind of early 90s uh, scene. This is when we were at. Um, 95, there was the second chance that I happened to be there in Shenzhen, but I was shocked at the point because I thought Shenzhen has no history. But all of a sudden, I was there uh, in the kind of old uh, village town kind of setting. So I see the, the skyscrapers in contrast with the kind of traditional tea houses and, and, and a lot of things. That was called uh, Shenzhen Market. Um, today it's uh, called East Gate, Dongmen. But that was before, this is the, the couple of slides I took. I didn't know where I was, but I took a couple of photographs uh, uh, in 95, before the demolition of that area. Now today it's gone. So I, I see this kind of duality between the modern skyscrapers and the village type uh, coexist in 95. 1992, this is the second time that Deng Xiaoping came to Shenzhen to reassure his uh, kind of economic reforms success. Now after that, Shenzhen was speeding up once again. A uh, very famous photographer uh, captures also the kind of condition uh, back in the early 90s. Time is money, efficiency is life, is the slogan at the point. So it was shocking at the time, I remember, because it's so different than the kind of prevailing uh, kind of political slogans uh, at the time. But at the same time, I, uh, the photographer also noticed that uh, Deng Xiaoping was quite worried. Look at his face. 
at the time. <laughs> that was at the time that Shenzhen was in crisis. In the early, if you read the history of Shenzhen, you know that was a discussion about socialism versus capitalism, uh, whether it is good at the point. But later on, he's much more happy <laughs> because he had reassured the successful uh, experiment. A couple of years later, this guy uh, came to Shenzhen with this group of students and, and wrote about and report uh, to the outside world the condition that is uh, really unique uh, happening in the PRD area. When we were in Shenzhen, it was as a time, uh, we call it the, the post Great Leap Forward, because Shenzhen has gone through 20 years of fast forward uh, development. It was 1999, so we decided, okay, uh, Urbanus is more than a design practice, it also should be a think tank, an urban curator and mediator. It aims to formulate architectural strategy from the complexities and uncertainties in contemporary Chinese urbanism. We are proud to say that we never changed that goal uh, we set up back then. And we have been very consistent to concentrate uh, most of our work in the city. We thought that uh, the architecture uh, tries to reestablish and stimulate a meaningful urban life in the current Chinese urban reality. And we witness uh, the kind of dramatic change uh, during the past 15 years in Shenzhen. And now, this is an interesting picture. You see the left is New York, the right is Shenzhen. For some reason, this looks like uh, quite similar from a distance. But don't forget, if you look at the, the map, you see the completely different type of city. The fabric is so different. And we believe that the city, uh, what's happening? The city should be uh, dense and complex. It's, it's kind of a dirty reality, it should not be totally cleaned up. Hybridity and coexistence of difference and otherness nurtures a vibrant urban life. I think that um, belief uh, supported us for all these years' work. And we have done a lot of projects. I'm not going to talk all of them. I will keep like three hours of doing that. But this is the kind of condition that we, uh, once we were in Shenzhen, were facing. It's the, it's the city of objects, of things that uh, crammed together um, without much uh, uh, kind of organization. If you look at this picture, it tells you uh, the kind of situation. Because of the fast urbanization, there are uh, isolated urban kind of voids and residues everywhere. So the very first task for us, these are very old projects I'm just quickly going to go through, is to refuel all these kind of voids. So we call it uh, urban refuel campaign to uh, try to establish linkages and new urban functions in the existing urban space uh, resulted from that. So we did a series of these uh, urban public spaces because there are also not much to do at the point. So we pick up all these uh, little jobs and try to fix it. But I think the point is that at the time, because of the unstable situation, because of the clients, a lot of times, especially the city, the government, doesn't know much how to do this type of residue space. So we give them suggestions and, and proposals, and they uh, accept. A lot of times, for example, like this, uh, architects have an opportunity to work with the clients to figure out not only the building uh, program, but uh, how to use them, this is one of the first uh, built projects we did in Shenzhen. It's a little uh, museum building with landscape and, and public space. And also it's one of the, the first uh, exposed concrete buildings in Shenzhen. And residue places like these, gradually uh, we transformed them into like little gardens. 
um, and pavilions. We have been keep doing this for almost like 10 years. A um, lot of these projects is already gone in the process of the latest urbanization. It, it played a significant role at the time to provide leisure spaces and, and public pocket parks for the immigrants in the city. So it's, and then we realized that it's important uh, to practice in, in a brand new place, to research, to learn about the city, even before you start design. So we call it a research design. I think the key point is this particular project. The research what we uh, did is not only uh, just a research for research sake, it's really at some points uh, lead to uh, the final design product. So it was at a time when uh, the housing price in Shenzhen uh, exceeds the capacity uh, to buy the product, uh, to buy the housing by the majority of people who live there. Uh, around 2005 and six, it was the point uh, uh, the, the, the price gets skyrocketed. It was exactly the same time we got the task. It, it was a research topic. It wasn't a real product at all. A lot of people didn't know that. It's a research project to study the possibility of adapting this typology, this kind of prevailing uh, too low uh, typology into a kind of dormitory like uh, new housing. So it's a given topic. So we did this research. We did uh, researched uh, all the different sizes, uh, the, 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 the spatial uh, configuration, and also uh, how people use that. So we come up with a series of, of research and proposals. Sometimes we think that this typology can be used in the urban kind of condition on top of the, the shopping mall, or maybe uh, more isolated, or uh, somehow uh, combined to create a little group. And finally, uh, the developer get interested and he's, they decided to do an experiment to maybe build it. So they, they select one of the typology. This is how the Tulo come into uh, existence. It's really be, uh, because of the research. And then I think more importantly, we come up with the strategy how uh, this thing can be adapted in an urbanistic condition and how the city and the developer can collaborate to acquire a cheap land, uh, to put this kind of uh, low-income housing uh, anywhere uh, in the city. This is how it's adapted in the end. It becomes a, a instead of a castle-like uh, typology, it really opens up and, and porous. And originally, we didn't have a, a, a site. But later on, we find this, uh, together with the developer, is uh, close to the highway. So the, 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 the dialogue between the building and the neighbor uh, becomes really critical. So the materials we use uh, is uh, really kind of a cheap uh, uh, prefab uh, concrete panels. And also the building itself is, is a hybrid building. It's not just housing, but also have a little inn and has um, public facilities and things like that. So it really becomes a testing ground for a, a kind of a, a new collective way of life that has been gone for many years. Uh, so we, uh, we did that internal courtyard. We add a little bit more dense area. And we built it in 2008. So life has evolved uh, quite a bit uh, after its completion. So we have been uh, using that as example to see how a new community uh, is formed. And uh, we're, we're very glad to see that there has been two dozen uh, newborn babies uh, out of this Tulo. There are many, many babies with old uh, ladies. Uh, hybrid stacking. We learned the experience from New York and of course Hong Kong as well, how to do vertical uh, buildings. 
In a site like this, it's very dense kind of urban sites in Huaqiang Bay, which is very famous for electronics. It, at one point, it contains 60% of the ele electronic parts in entire China. This huge market is vibrant, it's full of activities. But what happened is that the city government always want to clean it up and make it um, kind of a usual uh, shopping area instead of uh, to study the kind of the nature uh, behind this. So we did a lot of research of Huaqiang Bay and see how the different business coexist in this type of uh, urban condition. It's really not just a, a shopping street. It's an area inter intertwined with a lot of different forces. So once we had a, a project in Huaqiang Bay uh, in a very tight site um, like this, we noticed that uh, there are about 20, uh, 200,000 people passing by this site every day. And the site with a, a small hotel in the middle, the, it, it, the clients calls for uh, kind of a, a parking structure, a vertical parking structure with a compensation of this hotel. That's it. So what we can do, uh, we figure out is a good opportunity to reroute a lot of the traffic existing, either pedestrian or vehicular traffic, and also the logistics in the site. So you see the building, uh, actually, it has a little, a uh, uh, lot of arms that connecting to the existing building. So it's, it's an infrastructure, it's a vertical infrastructure. And it contains the kind of retail space on the ground floor, logistics and the ground, and multiple parking uh, structure in the middle and with a hotel on the very top. So it's a very hybrid building. Um, so the requirement is that there was one existing building on the site which cannot be uh, demolished and, can, and all the businesses have to keep uh, during the construction process. So it's quite a challenge to keep the building with all these volumes added on the top. So this is the kind of uh, the model that uh, is, is more than a regular building. It really becomes a machine uh, that contains uh, all these different portions. Even the, the multiple parking is considered to be flexible for future developments, maybe for retail, maybe for other purpose. On the top, I was envisioning a kind of a village type of uh, a hotel on the very top because of the privacy issue. You have to uh, keep the privacy. So. Uh, this is during the construction process. The building takes about 10 years to build. Um, it's, it's very complicated uh, steel structure. It has to go over the existing building. And the, the, the traffic pattern is also uh, quite complicated. It leads to different levels uh, of the building. So in the end, it's, it's come out like this. It hasn't been finished yet after 10 years already. Um, this, it tries to link uh, with the surrounding building. You don't see this building from the street. It's actually internal um, and it's hidden. So this is, uh, for us, is a very interesting typology that we, we kind of carry this thinking in a tight site uh, in, in different buildings. Uh, for example, like this one, even. Uh, on the periphery of uh, the site, it call, the clients called for uh, a hybrid building with factories, uh, a museums, and a library, and their headquarter office. We can't put regular uh, uh, buildings on the, on, this, on the same side, so we have to stack them somehow from the bottom up. And so we figured maybe uh, the building can be integrated and works also with the surrounding, even if it's, it's a very tough, kind of chaotic situation like this. I like this photo. It's, it's a hybrid building. So the museum is at the very top, and the factory is close to the noisy uh, highway, and the uh, office is at the other corner forming an internal courtyard. So the building uh, is looks simple at the, at the beginning from the outside, but it's very kind of complicated uh, inside. So it has a kind of a vertical uh, library in, in the very uh, at the very center of this building, 
it cuts through the entire uh, plant, and the plant, the factories, um, and the museum can see each other uh, at the beginning, at, at the middle. So this is kind of the, uh, the library. So it's kind of like an urban uh, square that people meet every day. Um, you have to go through this space to go to a lot of other uh, functions in the building. So it opens up um, this kind of uh, internalized uh, uh, kind of public uh, space in the middle. So even the stairs, uh, the courtyards happens in everywhere in, uh, in all parts of, of this building to get lights and, and ventilation. So the building um, becomes uh, a kind of monolithic at the same time, but also a hybrid inside. And beginning with that, and, and go further, uh, we pretty recently, we uh, got another uh, competition. We won a co another competition in the site like this. It's a very typical kind of no character um, residential district. It's kind of like this. It's a very typical uh, typology you see in China. The housing, the commercial, the school, the kindergarten. So it's a very quiet uh, place. And the competition calls on the very tight site a kind of a cultural and sports center. But later on, we, after the, the, we, we received the brief, we figured out that it's a very rare opportunity that we can stack things, and we have to. We have to build uh, almost like 70 meters of this cultural and sports complex. So for us, uh, we thought it's, it's a good chance um, to put the three portions of the buildings on top of one another, the bottom portion is really uh, uh, the library, the most accessible, usable uh, space, and the theater in the middle. And the middle portion is really the, uh, uh, the swimming pool and uh, the other facilities. The top is the sports. So the circulation, uh, besides the, the vertical uh, uh, elevator shaft, we created uh, these type of uh, linkage. We learned a whole lot from uh, the Hong Kong uh, and, and Singapore uh, shopping malls, the vertical shopping malls. I think that that could uh, really kind of create a different layers of, of uh, public space in, in the air. So look at this section. It has uh, the three components, the bottom, the theater in the middle, and the library, and the swimming pool in and the sports. And between that, there are uh, public gardens connected by huge escalators. And they are linked together. So even after each component, each box is closed at night, uh, the public access is still uh, valid. This is the model to show uh, the kind of relation uh, of course, this is very challenging structurally, so we hired a very good uh, structural engineer to make the structure a transfer, a lot of complicated uh, sort of uh, structure treatments to make it happen. It's in, uh, still in the process. And this is the updated uh, sections. Um, the reason why I show this is, is working uh, on the idea like this in, in China is very challenging. So we have to figure out all these kind of details and uh, how the structure and, and building merge together in sections. Okay. So this is going to be uh, how it looks. It's still in process. So the very last of this series of stacking uh, typology is this. We have a site. Um, Between the two little hills, in Shenzhen was a hilly town before. Because of the fast urbanization, all of the hills were raised to flat um, in the past 20 some years. So these are the two remaining uh, hills in the middle of the city at the moment. So you see the stripe uh, here. Right in the middle, there was a factory and the developer get this space, there's a huge site 
They want to build a kind of a complex. It's a commercial complex. But what they did, this is the SOM uh, master plan. And we were given this. There are basically towers um, by SOM. And this is uh, uh, apartment towers by a Hong Kong firm. And Architectonica is doing a huge shopping mall at the bottom. And then, it's interesting, there was 100,000 square meters of loft apartment buildings left uh, on the top of the, the roof of the shopping mall. So we were given the, the problem to design these apartments because the developer thought they can uh, make enough money by these towers and the malls and these apartments. So they don't care. They said, okay, whatever you do on the top, if you do the slab, that's okay. If you do something else, it's probably also okay. <laughs> but get us the square meter, 100,000 square meters done, that's it. But what we found is super interesting idea that SOM wants to connect the two hills uh, with bridges, with pedestrian bridges, because it's an island, totally an island, separated by uh, wide highways. So it's, it's an isolated site, but by connecting to the two public parks, it has a lot of opportunity. That This is what we thought. So we talked to the client, maybe we can make it flat. We can do our urban village on top of that shopping mall. The client said, wow, it's a good idea, but remember, you're going to get the same design fee. That makes really a, a, tough, a tough job, right? So we decided, okay, maybe we can do something because it's, there's never done this way to have smaller buildings on top of the huge shopping mall, which can uh, really form a village-like setting that people actually going from one park to the other can pass this uh, area. So we thought this is really different. Like, it reminds me of the New York experience. Once you are a shopping mall, you don't know what's above you, and then all of a sudden, once you go through the escalator or elevator, you go to the top, and you see the village. All of a sudden, uh, you see the village, and you see the hills. So you are above the existing city. It's quite a kind of a, a poetic kind of uh, idea. So we thought, okay, let's do that. So we create this little kind of a village with the bridges. Uh, it becomes an interesting kind of a, uh, uh, urban design project. But simply creating a village isn't really helps um, because it, it will look really odd if you have a cluster of a small buildings on top of the, the mall and have to have a dialogue with the towers. It's really tough. So you have to somehow small and big at the same time. So we create this envelope, uh, the, the intermediate uh, clusters of loft spaces that surrounds the village and which can dialogue uh, with the bigger towers. So it creates something like this. So we are not, on the, on, on the other hand, we are not afraid of a commercial projects. I think we do a lot of commercial projects. I think it's, it has a lot of opportunity to have a bigger impact on the city than smaller works. So it created this layered of spaces, the smaller in the center, the bigger of volume surrounding. So we have this gradient uh, kind of scale. Uh, and you see the mountains beyond. So there are commercial and law space, residential, office, museums, theaters, uh, all together on top of the existing building. So we tested all this, uh, different uh, sort of units, and the units is flexible. It could be 4.5 meters and could be 3 meters tall, so they can be uh, modified later on. So architects only laid out the frameworks, and the users can later make uh, modifications. So the construction started a couple of years ago, and this evolving. Now this is how it looked like. It's a huge project. 
Um, they haven't started the bridge yet. Um, you see the, on the other side, this is the bridge. Okay, so beyond this architecture project, I have to speak up. I will talk about another topic, which is uh, the city's growing difference. Um, why the Biennale of this year uh, has to be in the urban village? What is the urban village? After all these years, uh, there comes the coexistence of two urban realities in, in cities like Shenzhen. One is the kind of bottom-up, informal, uh, and one is the kind of top-down urban planning. So you get really this kind of a dual realities. You see the picture on the left and right. There are two aspects of the city. So within most of the new developed Chinese cities, the urban spaces are dominant by the monotonous architecture typologies, such as the gated communities, giant shopping malls, isolated office towers, and theme parks. This is very typical. On the other hand, the urban village, uh, like this, is the kind of byproduct of the rapid urbanization. It's the result of this kind of dual system of uh, the previous planned economy, the land ownership, created this kind of urban setting. There are many you know, urban villages still existing, providing housing uh, for new immigrants and to support the city for all these years. And like Bai Shizhou, this is one of the biggest urban villages still existing. And this is Xiaxia, another one. You see the kind of contrast between the village and the city itself. This is the Biennale site, the Nanto. Um, although it's, it's super dense and vibrant, it provides a, a very kind of a vivid urban lifestyle, which is actually urban inside the village or outside the village. This is the question. So a lot of people call it the urban village, but to be more accurate, is the urbanized village. So there are still 30 uh, urban villages inside the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, which provide housing clusters for the booming immigrant population at the moment. And what we can learn from all these kind of vibrant informal uh, settlements, uh, what the city around it can learn uh, from within the villages? These are the questions. So starting 2004, we have been researching these urban villages. We are um, trying to find ways to solve these problems, the kind of a super dense uh, condition, lack of public spaces, and all these issues. Can it be resolved, or it has to be raised uh, for the urbanization? So we envision at the point, a kind of a rooftop uh, urbanism, which can be connected, all these buildings. We thought that could be uh, a way to, to do it. In 2006, there was a critical time when the first uh, urban village get demolished uh, like this. And um, it was a kind of very different uh, so-called successful story to regenerate. Um, the village across the border of Hong Kong. So this is the very first example. It was at a time uh, when the city of Shenzhen tried to integrate the urban village into the city um, to get rid of all the urban villages in five years. Uh, the city announced the big plan in 2005. It was at the same time uh, the first biennale of uh, urbanism and architecture happens in December the same year. So we exhibited the urban village proposal in the first Biennale and we showed the city there are alternative ways um, to do it. And that was a critical moment. And then we published this little booklet about the urban villages. But unfortunately, uh, just before the Olympic 2008, uh, the village that we were focusing was demolished and replaced. 
So a little bit later, we involved in a real urban village intervention project, which is um, in this uh, Dafen village. It was a typical urban village uh, in the mix of uh, the city. But it's also a special village because it contains a very interesting kind of uh, uh, enterprise, uh, oil painting uh, business that were imported from Hong Kong in late 80s. So the village evolves itself. Uh, and at the same time, the government has been trying to, uh, to regulate and to improve, to invest uh, uh, in the village to make the, the business uh, booming. So it was a kind of co-effort of top-down and bottom-up. So it's, it's a rare opportunity to see the government to uh, engage into the village. And this is what we found uh, in originally in the village. It was a quite peaceful uh, kind of condition. It doesn't really have uh, the typical uh, urban village problems and everybody have a job and everybody uh, has this opportunity. So at the time we were uh, assigned the job to design a, a museum in the village. So we thought the museum is a good opportunity to really uh, make a, a, a linkage um, inside the village. So the museum is, should not be a typical museum. It should be a sandwich, a kind of uh, uh, overlapped, once again, of different things. Maybe the market uh, on the ground floor, the typical museum on the second floor, and also in a village on the top. So we uh, make this proposal and it was finally accepted with this kind of a hybrid museum um, in, the, in the urban village. So the ground floor was seen as an extension of the existing fabric of the village uh, with markets and, 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 and a lot of uh, kind of public functions. And the second level is a typical white boxes uh, museum. And the third level is a village of rentable spaces for tea houses and bars and, and restaurants and a lot of other things that typical museum uh, doesn't have. We see the museum as a device to bridge the village uh, with the surrounding uh, city. So the museum was built uh, in 2007, and uh, it was kept uh, empty for a while, and later, um, this is a village on the, on the, on the top, this is a vision that we provided. It shouldn't be that uh, simple and clean. It should be hybrid and vibrant. Um, but now, after almost like 10 years, it, it becomes one of the most visited museums in, in the city of Shenzhen. It's free. It's, uh, it accepts a, a, a wider audience. It's, it's because of the peculiar uh, location, it's trust a lot of visitors as well. So later on, we also organized a uh, kind of a painting um, wall mural uh, exhibition on the museum. So the museum itself is evolving. Uh, it seems like ever ended uh, project. So 2010 is a critical point when the first time uh, we put the urban village on the international kind of uh, level uh, we make it really uh, a public event uh, in, in case of this uh, World Expo uh, in Shanghai. We designed uh, the World Expo Pavilion. Also, we organized uh, uh, events in Dafen. We produced uh, this kind of uh, uh, installation project by uh, 500 uh, more uh, artists in, in Dafen and tell the story, that each individual story uh, of these people who work in Dafen for all these years. So this is really uh, an exhibition not about the architecture, it's about a group of people. Their personal stories collectively uh, becomes the Expo Pavilion. So it has always different kind of components in the exhibition, um, which uh, interactive, and also uh, on in Dafen Village, uh, there are a group of architects and, and artists uh, reworked the museum. 
by murals and other installations. And then we uh, publish a set of books. It's a, it's a collection of little books uh, about Dafen, the museum, the story of the people, and also about the urban villages in general. There's a new set of books coming out this year. It's called Xinjiang Case. Um, these are the byproduct of the Expo project. It has a, a thorough research of a lot of the urban villages uh, in Xinjiang, including Dafen as a kind of a case. 2011, uh, we uh, formally uh, started this kind of research uh, arm of Urbanus. Uh, we start to uh, use this opportunity to really study the kind of post-urban village uh, time that seems that we are ending, unfortunately. Starting 95, you see the city uh, only contains in this type of uh, configuration, but after only uh, 10 years, uh, the city has expanded so dramatically. It seems that we are entering this kind of post-VIC era um, in Shenzhen because of limited uh, land resources. The city is undergoing a huge campaign of so-called urban regeneration process. There are projects uh, everywhere which contain hundreds of millions of, of square meters of regeneration projects. They all the same pattern. So the tabula rasa isn't this the only model when the Chinese cities are now facing this kind of new urban regeneration process. So we are asking, uh, urban renewal has further kind of swept away the time-honored historical areas and the hybrid urban life. So this is the condition that we are facing the problem of, of being replaced by a more globalizing, standardized configuration everywhere. Not one, but hundreds of these are happening. All the urban villages are about to disappear. So at the point that we came up with the concept of cities, growth, indifference, it's really not just about the urban village. It's about the future of the city. Can we have a kind of a new city uh, paradigm of coexistence? So today's city uh, should be a manifestation of a balanced coexistence of different value systems. It should be a civilized community with maximum heterogeneity and diversity in which people co-live in one world sharing a variety of dreams. So this is kind of contrary to the, uh, the, the Olympic slogan that I remember. It's one world, one dream. I thought that was pretty scary. So I come up with a very different idea. The city's growing difference highlights multiple identities and multiple perspectives. It emphasizes difference, hybridity, and resistance. That was this year's Biennale. Um, so okay, so the last uh, story I'm gonna tell is really about the venue of this year's Biennale because uh, three weeks from now, we're going to come again, talk specifically about Biennale. So I'm not going to talk about the exhibition, but the venue. Why here? Once again, a lot of people still believe that Shenzhen is, uh, was a little fishing village. Let me tell you, that's not true once again. Right? Uh, the Shenzhen was an old city. Nobody trusts me. Look at this map of Qing Dynasty. The city of Nantou is here. Shenzhen has a history of more than 17, 1,700 years old. It's a very old town. Look at all these uh, involvement. I'm not gonna go to details. But I see the, the pictures in Qing Dynasty. In the 80s, 90s, um, the city evolves. This is the excavation, uh, the, 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 the site where people find a uh, city uh, 1700 years ago in Jin Dynasty, Dongjin. This is the site. 
But unfortunately, the city, uh, the old city was 90% uh, uh, gone. It's, uh, it's an urban village at the moment. But look carefully. The old town is still there. It really uh, becomes a kind of mixture of the earlier kind of industrial sites with the typical urban village. This is, you can tell this is quite a challenge for the Biennale. It's really an overlapping of a historical town underneath this contemporary urban village. So this is a very uh, interesting situation. You have the village and you have the remains and, and scattered sites inside the urban village, which is uh, historical. So it's, it's an invisible town, it's an invisible historical town, but here we go. Let me tell you, this little city gate is older than Tiananmen in Beijing. 600 year old in, in early Ming Dynasty, you see that. And you see uh, indigenous culture in Shenzhen, unimaginable. Old temples, see the mixture of historical and contemporary condition. You see buildings built in the 50s, 60s, 80s, and 90s. So very rare in Shenzhen you have a whole spectrum of architectural heritage. You see the whole thing, the whole history there. This is a very vibrant site. This is going to be host, uh, the opening ceremony here. And the factory ho will host uh, the thematic exhibition, the research. And this photo I like. You see the historical buildings together with mountain towers and village buildings. So the Biennale will be uh, part of the urban regeneration process. It's the first step. It's not the final answer, but it actually opens up an opportunity to engage the, 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 the exhibition with the real uh, village problems and, and, and condition. So the Biennale will also uh, scatter in, in the entire village. In the factory zone, it will open up um, this is a kind of a longer view of this regeneration. And in the, in the center, in the public plaza, uh, the exhibition will take uh, the, the, the center space and it will be uh, transformed into a more public uh, square in the middle. It's going to be additional small buildings and event spaces and public structures erected in the museum. So the exhibition becomes really not only an exhibition itself, it is going to be a real intervention, and this is going to be an action. So in the end, uh, in the summary, an urban intervention is all we do. It is a reflective kind of action taken in response to the complexities and uncertainties in contemporary urbanism in China. It transforms the role of the architect from service providers to multiple role of design thinker, researcher, urban curator, or mediator. Urban intervention is an activism with professionalism. Thank you. Thank you, Mangyan. Um I, I wanted to um, just uh, uh, kind of respond around um, sort of two uh, different kind of themes before we, before we open it up to um, questions from the audience. Um, I, I think uh, one of the most um, impressive aspects about your practice, um, aside from the, from the kind of um, amazing amount of production and buildings that you've done in um, uh, just the last uh, 18 years, I guess, um, is, um, you know, of course, I think the theme of your lecture, the engagement with the kind of urban, um, and you sort of laid out these themes like um, architecture for the city, the city inside the city, and the city above the city. 
Um, and I think particularly um, for, you know, from a kind of American context um, where we have um, sometimes a, sort of a kind of split between um, a disciplinary split between urbanism and architecture. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some people who design cities and there's other people who design buildings. Um, I think you have, you're clearly trying to um, sort of overcome that and you showed, you showed the, um, the pocket parks uh, at the beginning of the talk, but you, you actually didn't really show a lot of the kind of urban, um, urban scale projects that you've been, you've been involved with. Um, and you also didn't talk about, um, you know, kind of the area where you work, um, uh, OCT in Shenzhen, um, which you've actually kind of like totally designed the environment around your office, um, which is, I think, incredible. Um, the, so it's, it's a kind of, for those of you that don't, may not know, um, it's a kind of formerly um, industrial area with, with um, old factories and dormitories, which has turned uh, really into a kind of cultural hub um, with with Urbanus's office, but also the kind of public spaces um, that you've been involved with and um, the uh, uh, art terminal and the OCT museum and that sort of thing. So I, I guess um, the, but the, the kind of engagement with the urban is, I guess it, it really has a sort of um, agenda, if I read it correctly, um, which is sort of twofold, I would say. Um, which um, is number one, a kind of move away from the sort of the SOM or the kind of Western model of, of urbanism, I think, which has been really um, dominated the kind of development of Shenzhen in a lot of ways and sort of an awareness, like you said, of, of the kind of urban village, the history of something rather than being eradicated, um, maybe something to be aware of in its kind of messy and unique character and something to be um, preserved. Um, but also, you know, as, as you said, like in terms of policy now, people are also recognizing that it's kind of an economic engine of um, welcoming, welcoming migrants um, and providing affordable housing. Um, and so on the one hand, your, I think your urban agenda, you know, shows us the kind of those unique characters of Shenzhen, but also then um, another aspect of it, I think, which, is, which comes out in the kind of latter projects is um, this sort of idea of kind of vertical urbanism which comes um, not from the past, but as you said, like um, shopping malls in, in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, and I, I see that agenda as really um, also kind of against the sort of the tower and podium, um, and which leads to like some really interesting um, kind of typological uh, invention in these kind of very, these, these new sort of complex and um, three-dimensional uh, buildings that you're now, you're now working on. So I, that's, um, I would say one part of the, the, the kind of engagement with the urban. Um, and the second part that I kind of see, which maybe you spoke about less, but alluded to um, in your role as a kind of urban, uh, sort of urban curator, urban mediator, is um, maybe about um, the, the way in which dialogue uh, plays, a, plays a role in your practice. Um, and of course, you're, you talked about your, your curating the, um, the upcoming Shenzhen Biennale, so you're obviously bringing together other architects, um, but you also um, collaborate a lot with other architects. That's, that's actually how we met um, yep. seven seven years ago. Um, and um, but, but, and then of course you you have a um, in your office you actually have a gallery where you invite um, artists and architects and you show your work and you bring other people. Um, and uh, your partner um, Xiaodu in his uh, in his off hours has actually opened a bar. Um, in now it's closed. Oh, it's closed. Okay, it's gone. Architects okay. can't make good business. That's okay. the problem. Right? Usually, usually we tell architects to, um, you know, moonlighting is moonlighting is good. It's hard. It's hard to make money in architecture, but it right. turns out it's the opposite for. Uh, it's the architecture for you is is more um, more productive, I guess. And but anyways, you I guess coming back to dialogue, um, you know, you also talked about the the dialogue with um, with kind of developers too. And so I'm wondering, um, I guess, you know, how do you, um, in New York City, when we, when we kind of talk about the city and when we have dialogues about the city, there's, there's maybe a tendency to, um, that either certain, certain voices are kind of often excluded or we, we land up with like, through all the kind of dialogue, we often land up with the kind of lowest common denominator. Um, so I guess my, maybe a question then is about, um, 
you know, how do you maintain your own voice in all this kind of dialogue and with all these people? Um, and so that's that's kind of a first question, I guess. Yeah, it's it's always tough um, to convince people to believe you. They don't have to. I think it's uh, it's. It's, it's a good opportunity for uh, architects to expand your uh, field of, 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 of research. I think you, if you understand, I think the reason why we do research, um, even before we, we do actually design, is to really use uh, the project opportunity to understand the city better. Uh, if you want to have a, a, a kind of a valid dialogue or a more convincing dialogue with whoever you talk to, you better understand the situation better. So we are actually can share a lot of the things. Otherwise, you have to, you know, a lot of time you talk to your own self, that people don't respond very actively. So that's why I think we, we, we have this kind of research um, idea, not just for, uh, you know, I, I think the, the research portion is really, uh, important to understand, to really define the problem better. Um, I think a lot of times, and uh, I think the crisis at the moment for architecture is that we have so much solutions, but no problems. Mm. You know, we have so many uh, technically know-how, but a lot of time if the, the target is wrong and, and you don't get what you want mm. to get. And so like on a, on a purely kind of logistical level, um, like how do you, uh, you, you didn't talk that much about the kind of process in the office mm -hmm. and, and maybe you could um, talk about how you find, I mean you showed like 10% of your projects. Um, you know, you, how do you find time to kind of do research and how do you do research and how does that happen in the office? Is it something mm -hmm. separate? Is it, does it happen with each project? Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, the research, uh, we actually, we started this uh, Urbanus uh, Research Bureau, later UPRD, in 2011. But actually, the research starts from the very beginning. Um, but not, like formally, we established a branch that like, doing research and then, then this portion is doing design. Because we, we see each project is opportunity to learn, to, to understand the city, to understand the problem better. Mm. Um, I mean, like, you know, the city of Shenzhen for us is a new place. We were, were not born there, we don't know this place. We just all of a sudden we were there, because of, not because we like the city, just because we hate the city, right? <laughs> because we, we see so many problems in the city. So we want to, because if we have to work there, we have to improve our own environment, the same thing like you mentioned the OCT, right? The reason why we do that, we have to make ourselves comfortable. We have to make the environments better. So in the office, I think uh, every project is a chance that you really uh, take that chance to, to learn. Just like, the, the, I mean like architects, we, we, we can't work like superficially uh, uh, in, in a kind of a vacuum. You, you have to be like, uh, like an artist or a novelist. You, know, you have to experience, you have to live there to experience the life and, and, and really understand the issue. Mm. So uh, I think there's no clearer sort of definition between the design and, and research. It's all design, just like the, the, when we talk about urban design, what is actually urban design? I, I didn't show a lot of our urban, sort of so-called urban projects, but what about the architecture? You know, architecture is also part of the urban design, I think. Uh, also the landscape. We never, none of us actually learn landscape at all. Um, but I, I, I see that opportunity to really become an urban project. So I, I think that's the kind of situation uh, we really want to, uh, to tackle, to, to add this kind of a complexity to the city that we live. It's, it's too simple-minded uh, a lot of times. People see problems. Uh, we, we, that's also why we use, uh, we want to use this kind of uh, urban, uh, uh, the Biennale situation uh, to bring people, to bring different voices and different expertise to tackle this issue. I don't think that we can, alone, we can deal with that. 
we need help. We need a lot of help, actually. Uh, we're not that powerful at all. So. Well, I, I think the, um, you know, from the, the, the Dauphin Museum, which you, um, you built in um, 2005, I mean, that's, that shows in a way how, you know, a single piece of architecture can kind of transform, you know, bigger urban territory around it. And if I, if I understand your, mm -hmm. you know, your, your, inter your proposal for the Biennale correctly, um, it sounds like a very a similar intent. And I think it's actually, re it's really nice having you also at this point, um, kind of at the beginning of the semester and speaking for the, um, for the, for the third semester, we're at this kind of hinge between mm -hmm. sort of looking at the city and looking at the site and then looking at our, our kind of um, the beginning of our sort of buildings. And so I think your, um, your way of op operating is actually very, um, you know, sort of relevant, I think, also for the, for the, for the students here. Um, mm -hmm. the, should we open it up to questions? Sure. Actually? Yeah. Um, oh, Graham. Uh, uh, Jan, thank you so much. Fantastic lecture. And it's been many years I've followed your career uh, with great admiration. And what I found uh, especially interesting in this presentation was the long personal history, going back into the 80s with the sketches, which I'd never seen before. And the, it's kind of interesting that when China was in a massive industrial revolution, if you like, in that period, very fast growth. You were looking at art, and then in, I see it as a kind of theme through a sort of intelligence and an intellectual reaction against um, uh, accepting the change that actually is happening, but trying to find another way to reflect intellectually about how to work with it in, in very close uh, proximity. And actually, the choice to move to Shenzhen uh, would be very interesting to know uh, more about that exactly, how you did that. Uh, uh, that would be my question. Yeah. Good question. Uh, why? Uh, at, at the time, I think, uh, we, uh, when, when we were uh, in Beijing at the time, in the, in the early uh, 90s, I think it was at the time when Deng Xiaoping actually went to Shenzhen in 92. He kind of reassured that uh, the, the model was, was, uh, was quite successful from his point of view. And we heard a lot of happenings at the time you know, in, in Shenzhen. And I uh, happened to be there like twice in the, in the early 90s. And after I came to the U.S., of, of course, um, Shenzhen was, was booming in, in the, the kind of uh, late 90s. And it, it, it generates a lot of opportunities for architects. It was at a time when, at the very beginning, there were big firms uh, going to uh, Shenzhen and later Shanghai to practice uh, in mid-90s. And later on, I think more and more kind of independent firms in, 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 in the U.S. and Europe, they go to cities like Shenzhen. So I, I, at the point, I remember when I was in New York, we, we heard a lot of uh, kind of uh, rumors that this city provided uh, some opportunity for the desperate architects like us uh, <laughs> surviving. Uh, so we were very curious. So this is a kind of, uh, it's, it's really kind of opportunity driven, I would say. I never imagined myself to be in Shenzhen. I think at the very beginning in, in my first trip, I took like 30 hours from Beijing by train uh, to Guangzhou and another four hours or something to Shenzhen, you know, to just see in, in 1988, the, the, the bunches of high rises uh, because that's the only place that in China you can see uh, high rise buildings. So we, but besides that group of uh, high rise buildings, there was nothing in the city. It was so boring and there was nothing happened and no history like uh, what I imagined before just because of you don't know a lot so, of times. So 
in the last Nantu old village, um, like that's a new one for me, uh, and it's going to be the, the site for the, the Biennale. I was amazed that you found this archaeology underneath of, it's not an, it's actually, and then you had the map with the multiple old cities across the territory. That was, uh, I, I mean, I'd seen your exhibitions before of the growth of Shenzhen, but I'd never seen that deeper early history. Um, how did that happen? Good question, because uh, let me tell you this, the, the Biennale uh, actually came later. Uh, the research of Nantou comes earlier. Before, yeah. I think that's the reason why we bring the Biennale to Nantou, actually. We did, uh, about a year ago, we did a, a research by chance. I know Nantou, we have been to Nantou, of course, but not uh, really a thorough research. But uh, in, in 2015, we, we, uh, we started the, the research of Nantou. And um, we found this, this amazing history. And, uh, and at the same time, we, we heard the district government was trying to regenerate or redevelop Nantou at the point. We know there was, there was the force there. There was the power that wanted to change something. But uh, and later on, we found they didn't really know how because they thought about, and Nantou was an old town, and everybody know that. At, at one point in the Qing Dynasty, it controls Hong Kong and Macau. And Hong, uh, Hong Kong and Macau were separated from China, just uh, in Nantou, actually. It was a county office uh, that controls the whole region. It was really big. So at the point, we thought that was really something different. And after that research, about a half year, then we thought, okay, maybe the Biennale, and we were elected as chief curator, that uh, we thought, okay, maybe that we should bring other expertise because people are confused. They want to redevelop Nantou to the historical town to bring back history because it's like Lijiang, you know, all these kind of a tourist attraction. That's very typical kind of thinking. They want to do that. And uh, there are original plans there are already tons of plans in the past 10 years that they want to rebuild this kind of historical glory of that, that period. So we thought that's quite scary. And then we thought, okay, maybe it's time to uh, bring a whole lot of expertise and, and knowledge uh, to Nanto. That's how the Biennale happens. So. Okay, last thing. Um, it, I find like, one of the really sort of beautiful things is that you have this utopic capacity to imagine impossible things to go together and, um, and for in really actually impossible life to be lived together and you make it work. So what is your deep philosophy? Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, I mean, how do you, you know, when so much in China is to make it modern, make it fast, make it quick, how did you arrive at this um, way of seeing and of being with a calmness in the middle of, I know you're not calm all the time, uh, in the middle of all this change. I mean, it's just fantastic, I think. Is there a lesson you can teach us uh, in there? I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a tough uh, question. I, I, I think... Um, to be uh, tolerant, uh, to be inclusive of different ideas and different opinions, and to add uh, complexity and, and kind of novelty in a way in the kind of burnout uh, situation that we are at every day. It's not, I mean, in, working in China is exciting on one hand, but it's very dangerous and, and also very, um, it, it drains you very quickly, I would say, that a, a lot of architects and, and a lot of firms who work in China uh, get drained very quickly uh, just because you have to follow. There was a, there was a, a kind of an invisible power surround you that kind of push you to somewhere that you don't know at the point. But uh, uh, I think to, 
to really uh, based on on my experience. I think there are many different aspects of my experience, especially the earlier experience. You know, I you know, look at the, the kind of com complex sort of history, you know, uh, of, of my career in you know, like living. 20, 30 years in Beijing, this kind of uh, cultural history in the middle of this kind of deep tradition, but at the same time, a crazy city where we built CCTV and all these kind of uh, monuments, uh, this kind of paradoxical condition, but all of a sudden we, we, we were in New York and, and, and live in a place like this. And, and to be in Shenzhen all of a sudden, in a brand new city with no history. Um, so I think this is a kind of a paradoxical uh, condition that really shaped the, the kind of, you, you call it philosophy, or something deep uh, embedded uh, in our mind. The, the kind of uh, desire and anxiety, uh, you know, something that you want to do something, but based on uh, what you learn, what you experienced previously, uh, this everything kind of come together. I don't know. It's it's, it's a very complex kind of feeling that um, you want to change. Um, I don't know. If, you know, answer your question. I couldn't. I, I tried very hard. But <laughs> it's, it's too difficult. But um, other questions. It's a whole lot of uh, information, I think. Uh, sure. Could you describe the future of the bicycle and bike lanes in China? It used to be the bicycle and the bicycle. You know, if, if you notice that the, they're on the internet, that now China is, is, is going back to this kind of bicycle, uh, kind of maniac. Uh, craziness. Um, in, uh, I remember, uh, I totally agree with you, in the 70s and the 60s and 70s, the, the city is full of bicycles. We are like number one. It's a bicycle kingdom. Uh, people ride bicycles to work, to everywhere. Um, but later on, because of the, the, the cars and all the, the, the expanding uh, traffic uh, condition is, is totally changed. But now, it, because of the internet, there are bicycle companies now. It's, it's everywhere. The shared bicycle is a big thing now in China. It's, if you go to China, you go to Beijing and Shenzhen, this is a big problem with the bicycle at the moment. It's because the government uh, wants to regulate the, 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 the shared bicycle, but haven't figured out a way yet. So they have to stop. There are uh, millions of new bicycles coming out. But I think that uh, I think we're somehow going back, I think, now to the kind of bicycle enthusiasm, in a way. Uh, it's kind of a more intelligent bicycle system. Uh, even for the Biennale, I think we're actually uh, targeting to incorporate the bicycle, because the, the venue um, we don't have a uh, subway connection. The venue is kind of isolated. It doesn't have, oh, well, the, pub, the bus is there, but it's not really convenient. I think the bicycle could really help. So I don't know. It's, it's, it, to me, it's a it's, it's very good way uh, to really slow down. The bicycle gives you a, a good opportunity to experience the city in a complete different way. But unfortunately, we lost that for the past 30 years, almost. So. Oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs>
something like, uh, um, for example, you would probably purchase um, a house in OCT um, mm -hmm. for about just ridiculous amount of money that mm -hmm. you have to pay. But if you rent a house, um, you can probably, with the same amount of money, you can probably rent a house for like 100 years or 120 yeah. years. So why would anybody ever purchase a house if you can just rent it until you die? Um, so that becomes like the real struggle for uh, Shenzhen citizens. Uh, so nobody really buys houses anymore. So people just rent house forever. And that's a situation that's facing um, the Western US, uh, some part of Eastern US as well, um, just because you know you just can't afford to purchase a house. So people just kind of live on uh, the life of renting. And it's been working out great. Like Airbnb, Airbnb definitely helped out uh, as well. Um, so as an architect, um, I would like to know your stand, uh, point of stand on this kind of urban situation where uh, we wouldn't be able to really build new houses anymore because there won't be any consumers for them. So, yeah. It's probably not that simple. I think deeply rooted in every Chinese, I would say there is a very uh, kind of, there is an urge to buy, to own. <laughs> Let me tell you, this is exactly true. Uh, I mean, the Chinese is, is probably the most enthusiastic, uh, uh, enthusiastic to buy, to own something. I mean, we, we came from this kind of agricultural uh, civilizations. I mean, every farmers want to have their own land. That's why the urban village is so unique, because in, in Mao period, everything belongs to the country, belongs to the government, belongs every piece of land in the city, belongs to the city government and the central government. The only exception, because Mao is from the countryside, the only thing that he left for the farmer as a compensation is their plot for their housing. This, this, this is why the urban village survives, because of the, the private ownership. In socialist or communist China, it's hard to imagine there are private owned or collectively owned property. That's the only exception. That's why I think the whole campaign of integrating the urban village into the city is to get rid of that. Let me tell you this. That's the whole kind of secret, to get rid of this private ownership. After five years, if we're successful, to get rid of all the urban villages, then the city becomes monolithic. It's, it's, you can, all the developers can do whatever they want because now it's super difficult. You have to negotiate with individual owners of any piece of land. Just like New York, you know, people own different pieces of land. So you can't take, even Rockefeller, you cannot take a big chunk of land and develop one million square meters in one shot. But in China, that kind of project is everywhere. But regarding your project, uh, uh, regarding your question, I think, um, of course, renting is a big issue because people cannot afford, especially young people. In Shenzhen, especially, you know, people like us are extremely old people. <laughs> you know? I mean, the average uh, 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 age in Shenzhen just reached uh, a past a little bit of 30 years now. Before, it's all like 20-something. Now, it's, it's getting older. Uh, uh, and people can't afford. So there, I think the good news is that uh, now, because of the urban village, uh, because of the, the changing of the policy and also the kind of economic condition, a lot of the, even the developers are looking into opportunities to renovate a lot of the urban village uh, housing into rentable apartments for young uh, immigrants. I think this is, uh, to me, it is just happened, uh, I think, this year. I think this is a good mood. Uh, possibly, uh, if that happened, that's keep happening. Now, even uh, I, I told uh, Adam uh, that even the leading developer, you know, uh, Wang Qi, who is the leading, uh, leading developer in China, they also, they are renting uh, 
uh, a lot of the, the, the farm buildings, the, the, uh, the village buildings, actually, uh, to manage somehow and renovate and, 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 and rent out to the, to the, to the young uh, immigrants who just came. I think that's, that's a, at least a good kind of start to, to think. But once again, Chinese, they, they want to own. There are people who's going to buy, no matter how expensive. I cannot afford, but some people can. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation that you did. It, it was very inspiring. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you studied uh, on how to build in dense and tight areas from New York and how different businesses cooperate and coexist. Uh, how, how did your experience from New York help you in your projects in, in Shenzhen? Uh, 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 excuse me, uh, can you uh, repeat the last uh, sentence? Uh, 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 how your experience uh, from New York helped you in your projects in Shenzhen? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's basically um, what I learned from, from New York is that um, New York has a very kind of generic uh, kind of uh, planning uh, grid system. It's a very kind of generic and flexible system. But on the other hand, because of the individual uh, private ownership, the outcome of the city is quite diverse, um, quite individualized, because if, like I said before, each, in, uh, each developer can only take a piece of land, adjacent lands, and develop uh, his own. He can take a large chunk of land to develop kind of a monolithic projects. I think uh, in China, especially in Shenzhen before, the land was quite cheap. And uh, it's fairly easy to acquire a big chunk of land to develop a small building, relatively small building on that land. So that's why you, you, if you look at the plan, uh, I have that comparison plan between Shenzhen and New York from uh, 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 above the air. So you see the fabric is so different. Uh, one of the reasons is the land ownership and, and people, the way people use the land to create this kind of isolated islands of developments and objects. But in 2004, and, and five, Shenzhen established the first in China, the kind of economic, uh, not economic, e ecological uh, preservation line, which kind of a, a self-restraint. It's, it's kind of a pioneering efforts to set up a red line for its own developments. Um, so uh, beyond that, uh, Shenzhen has very limited uh, land resources now. That's why so many uh, sort of urban regeneration projects is going on at the moment. There are very few new kind of developments. Um, so I think this is how we can learn from uh, New York, is really to how to redevelop in the existing kind of a, a situation. New York is not, is, is like constantly evolving uh, is like redevelop uh, uh, and build the city upon the city itself. I think it's that process uh, that the, the new city uh, like Shenzhen now is learning. Uh, so I think this uh, is an interesting kind of uh, period of time when the city has to think about how to densify itself. Because everybody in Shenzhen uh, saying, okay, we have no land to develop now. But if you look at the, the fabric, right, from the Google map, you know, if you, if you are a New Yorker, you look at the Shenzhen, the fabric, you see empty lots everywhere, right? So it's, uh, that's the difference. I think now people start to realize how uh, to densify the existing, how to make the, the, the fabric really work better. It, it's a long way to go.
because we already developed a lot of things. You have to change the policy. You have to really start from the policy level to redevelop the existing city. It's really tough, but it's time to do that. Okay, um, thank you, Meng Yan. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.